Thank you for coming, everybody. It's lovely to see so many people here. Um, that's really good. So um, I'm going to talk. Uh, so this is the only talk that will really have a bit of science in. But I'm not going to talk any, any heavy science. Um, but I, I thought I would give just a very quick survey of the sorts of things that we did while Danny was here and some of the things that he was particularly interested in. Um, so as Steve said, um, Danny was here in the, in the 1980s doing his PhD with Keith. Um, Keith would have really liked to be here, but he's, he's away at the moment, unfortunately. Um, and then he came back to work as a postdoc with me in 1991. This is what he looked like at the time. This was the photo, uh, the group photo that uh, was taken when he arrived. And then, uh, as people will know, he, he went on, he got a, an EPSRC advanced fellowship and then went through the ranks um, in the department and ended up uh, as a professor and senior tutor uh, three or four years ago. And that's, uh, that was a more recent photo um, taken up on the uh, balcony of level eight. So, what I'd like to say first is, is a little bit about what, what Danny was like as a person, and I'm sure you will hear uh, this same sort of comments over and over again today. Um, he was really passionate about his science. He loved doing science, and he loved thinking about experiments, he loved working in the lab, um, and he loved working out what was going on in the experiments. He really enjoyed working with the students, he, he, would, he would enjoy going to the lab, and, and working um, at the coal face with the students, and he always had time for them when they had uh, things that they wanted to discuss. He was always really good at communicating science at lots of different levels. He was a really good undergraduate lecturer and won prizes for that. And um, he was also very good at, at writing things. Um, uh, and often when we were writing things like a grant application or a paper, he was the one that would find the right way to phrase things um, in a way that would get the right points across. And he gave up time as well for building up um, the science community, particularly uh, quantum optics and iron traps, and we'll hear more about that later on. Um, and just as a general thing, and this fits in with what was just said, he, he was the person who would always say yes, uh, if he possibly could, if people wanted help. And uh, so uh, uh, he was a great guy to have around. I tried to think about what his main interest was in science. I tried to think of a way of bringing it together. And I think he, he was mostly interested in quantum coherence, in looking at systems that demonstrated quantum coherence. He was interested in the weirdness of quantum mechanics and, and liked to, to see ways that that was manifested. And um, so what I mean by this is just the process by which some sort of an atomic system um, can preserve the, neat, the unique sort of quantum mechanical properties, um, in a particular when it's in two states at the same time and you see the effect of that in the way it behaves. Um, and a really good way to, to study this is with an iron in an iron trap, and that was why he focused his work on iron traps um, over the last uh, 24 years while he was here. And why isn't this working? Oh, there wasn't anything working. Okay, uh, so he, he chose to focus his work on, uh, on the penning trap. Uh, most groups working in this sort of area around the world work with radio frequency traps, but we particularly focused on penning traps here uh, to have a slightly different edge on that. Um, but he was also interested in other other sorts of systems that demonstrated quantum coherence. I'm not going to talk about that, but in particular, he worked at the OU um, on some experiments in, in EIT. So thinking about iron traps, um, I, I thought I'd better start by saying what an iron trap is. So it's just a way of suspending particles in space um, such that they're well isolated from the environment. So this is what it looks like. There's a there's a ring electrode. This, this structure, so in our cases, this would be the internal diameter would be like a centimeter, that sort of order of magnitude. So there's a central ring electrode, and then there's two end cap electrodes, and you put the whole thing together, and that makes the trap. And you put, you put positive potentials on those two end caps and a negative potential on the ring, and uh, that will trap particles in this vertical direction, in the axial direction, and then you apply a magnetic field in that direction, and that will give you three-dimensional confinement. I won't talk about how that comes about. But essentially, then, if you drop an iron 
into this, or a cloud of ions into this structure. They'll stay there. And effectively, they'll stay there forever. And um, the beauty is that they're well isolated from the environment. Um, you do this under vacuum, so the particles don't, don't hit any, any background gas molecules. They don't hit the walls, so they're very well isolated. And so it's a good system in which you can study the way that particles interact with light. And the motion in the trap, um, so in that axial direction, it's just an oscillation, just a simple, a simple harmonic oscillator. And the radial motion in the horizontal plane here, the iron goes round in, go, oh, goes round in circles um, with this little jiggling motion. And it has two components, as you can see, to that motion. So this is what the iron trap is, and that's how it works. So if you want to look at quantum coherence in a trap, you need to do a number of things. First of all, you have to build one. Um, then you have to understand how the iron moves in the trap. You need to apply laser cooling to confine the motion down to a small area to, to keep the iron cold and well localized. You need to find out how to, find, how to trap one iron at a time rather than a whole, uh, a whole bunch of irons. And then you need to, this is, the, this is the more difficult bit, is you have to find a way of getting the iron into the ground state of its motion. So I showed you that oscillation in the axial direction. What you need to be able to do is to put it right at the, at the bottom of the potential well by taking away all its energy. And that's a second stage of, of laser cooling, which I'll come on to in a minute. And then once you've got it in that ground state, then you can try putting it into a superposition of two states that's where it really becomes quantum mechanical. And at that point, you can start to do some interesting physics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these things and how, how uh, we achieve them here. Because Danny's work tackled all of these issues, and he was interested in all of these um, things. So when Danny arrived, we built the trap. So we'd done the first stage. And this was the trap that we were working with at the time. Um, we called it Old Faithful because there were various stages where we built other traps and they didn't work, and then we ended up going back to this one, and it always did work. So this became known as, as the old faithful trap. And what we were doing at the time, we were learning how to laser cool ions, and we were learning how to, how to control the way they moved in the trap and how they interacted with each other. And we were working with magnesium. That's the direction of the magnetic field in this trap. It's horizontal rather than uh, vertical. And those, where that arrow goes, that's the electrodes. This thing here is just a holder for the, for the lens. Um, to, to look at the light coming off, but the, these are the, the electrodes. And then here, there's, there's an oven to create atoms uh, that get ionized inside the, inside the trap for loading it. And um, this was the sort of signal that we could see at the time. So you've got uh, fluorescence as you change the frequency of the laser. And as the laser goes towards the exact resonance with the iron, then the signal goes up. When you go above the resonance, instead of getting laser cooling, you then get laser heating, so everything disappears. So that vertical drop there um, is what you expect to see once you get to the center of the, of the transition. So this is a demonstration, um, a simple demonstration that laser cooling is taking place uh, in that trap. So I don't know why it does that. Um, now, in those, I'm sorry that I'm sucking a sweet, by the way, but I've got an awful cough, and the only way to hold it off is to, is to permanently suck Hall's extra strong cough sweet, so that's why I'm doing that, because otherwise I should be coughing the whole time. Um, now, in those days, um, uh, lots of this sort of stuff, this some of the uh, spectroscopy in, the, in atomic systems was done using dye lasers, and those of us who, who were doing this sort of stuff, we'll know and love, um, know and love those dye lasers, and we're very pleased to see the back of them in many cases. And I'll come back to that a bit later. A bit later. So these are the sorts of phrases that will make people come out in a cold sweat. Rhodamine 110, which was a horrible dye to work with, working with temperature-tuned cr uh, crystals for frequency doubling, and trying to do these experiments with very low powers. Nowadays, you can buy something off the shelf that will give you a thousand times that amount of power. So this was, um, this was a struggle at the time, just keeping the dye laser working. Um, we only had one dye laser, but even so, it was a real effort to, to keep it going. And then what we did, one of the early experiments we did, just after Danny arrived, we ended up having to borrow another dye laser um, because we needed two at the same time. So that, was not, um, a very, uh, that wasn't a very convenient thing to do, to have two of these things to keep uh, running at the same time. Uh, I'll say what this experiment was just because... 
I think it's a nice demonstration of what, of what you could do. So this was a pulsed laser that we borrowed, and um, uh, it was it, uh, the same sort of laser that Danny had used in his PhD, so he was really happy to use that laser. The rest of us were terrified of it because it was a pulsed laser and it, and it had really high power and we weren't used to working with that sort of thing. So uh, this was, uh, he was, he was, so when we, when this arrived and he unpacked the box, it was like, it was like a great big Christmas present for him. He, uh, he loved getting that, uh, getting it together and getting it to work. And what we were doing was this, we had, so here we've got an iron cloud in the trap and it always rotates inside the trap. Um, you can't stop that, it's because of the magnetic field. So this is rotating, but we didn't know the exact frequency at which it was rotating, and we were interested to find out what that frequency was. And here's the laser that does the laser cooling, and what we do is we monitor the fluorescence from the iron cloud the whole time. And what we did with the pulsed laser was we zapped this iron cloud with a very intense pulse, and all the ions that fell inside the laser, this shaded area, all those ions got put into a state where they no longer interacted with, the laser, with this laser. But then that patch of dark ions, if you like, as it, rotates, as it rotates around and it goes through this laser, you get a dip in the fluorescence every time the dark ions go through the laser beam. And so um, this allowed us to measure directly how, how, um, how fast the ions were rotating. And you can see here... You, here's, the, here's the bang where the, um, where the pulsed laser goes off. And then here you can see these dips every time the iron, those dark ions go round. Uh, and so we were able to measure the rotation frequency in this trap uh, for the first time. And that told us about how dense the ions were uh, inside the trap. Now, I said that one of the things you need to do is you need to be able to work with single ions. And um, that is... Uh, uh, it's, it's an important step um, to, uh, to be able to do that, and, it, and it's something that you have to be able to do routinely. Uh, this was another of the traps that we were working with um, at the time. If you want to study quantum effects, you really need to have a single particle, or you, you need to be able to prepare a single particle. And um, working with a single ion is difficult because uh, everything becomes more sensitive and there isn't much signal because one ion can't give you an awful lot of light when you put it in a laser beam. So uh, everything becomes more, uh, more difficult to do. But then you have to ask the question, how do you know that there's only one ion there at a time? And there's three ways, really, that we could do that. I'm going to talk a, uh, a little bit about each of those. Um, the first one is to measure the amount of fluorescence that you see. And here is a... Here is a plot where we measured how much light we saw from the iron cloud as we ran the, uh, the, this little oven that generates the atoms that get ionized at different currents. And you can see if you turn the current down, the number of ions you get goes down. That's what you'd expect to see. And then at some point here, it stops. So if it's, if it's below this level, you see nothing. And if you turn it above this level, you see a very small amount of signal. So essentially that you would expect that that comes from a single particle rather than a cloud of ions. And up here, you're getting lots and lots of ions. And um, so to confirm that you really have got one ion when you've loaded like this, uh, you need to look for quantum jumps. And I'll say what quantum jumps are. Um, this is a particular thing. Again, it's a, very, it's, a, it's a quantum mechanical effect. It only comes about when you've got a single particle. Um, and it's, a, it's an illustration of, of the sort of weirdness of quantum mechanics, if you like. So imagine a, an atom that has three levels. Okay, I've labeled them one, two, three. And this is your laser cooling transition. So you, you shine laser light resonant with that transition, and you get lots of fluorescence the whole time. And you can monitor that fluorescence. And then if there's some mechanism by which the ion can end up here on some weak transition, so the ion ends up in this state, if it's sitting in this state, then it can't absorb this light anymore. So the fluorescence that you see must disappear at that point. So you see strong fluorescence, and then it stops when the ion is here. And when the ion falls back down to here, then it can absorb the light again, and you see more fluorescence. So what you expect to see is a, sig is a signal that turns on and off um, when there's only one ion present. It turns on and off, and that tells you uh, that the ion is moving about between this system of levels here and this one here. Um, oh, I meant to... Yeah, anyway, that's what I said. So here's an example 
This is with two irons, and you can see clearly, you've got some of the time you see both irons fluorescing, some of the time one iron is fluorescing and one iron is dark, and some of the time both irons are dark. Um, so that's a clear indication that you've got two particles here. You can see it very clearly. And um, this is the sort of physics that Danny was really interested in because it's a purely quantum mechanical effect um, that you see this, um, this, this uh, jump in, uh, this abrupt jump in the fluorescence level. And the, um, the final way that you um, can confirm that you've got a single particle is to take some pictures. So um, here we've got pictures of uh, a small iron cloud, about 10 ions. And then when you reduce it to five ions, you can see it gets smaller. And then uh, when you get down to one iron, it gets smaller still. And in fact, here is a, um, here is a, um, uh, a, a picture of that when everything was optimized. When you've got a single particle there, when you've got a single particle there, um, the image that you see gets very, very small. And as soon as you had more than one particle, that image would be significantly bigger. So that's how you know at this point that, again, you know that you've got a single particle um, because the size of the image is smaller than it would be if you, had, um, if you had more than one particle there. So that's the other way that you can confirm that you've only got a single particle in the trap. Now, um, all of this work we were doing with magnesium, and uh, magnesium is easy to work with, um, especially in a penning trap. Um, it, has, it has two atomic levels that are of interest, this one here and this one here. But when you apply the magnetic field, those levels split into a number of components. But the nice thing about magnesium is that you can use a trick called optical pumping, and with that trick, um, you only need one laser. So although you've got several, la several uh, levels here, you only need one laser, and that will give you constant laser cooling. So that's why you only need one dye laser to do these experiments. The problem is that if you want to do some more interesting physics, you need to have a system that has a more complicated energy level structure. So in a sense, what we, um, what we could do with a magnesium was limited. Um, and if you wanted to really look at coherence effects, you had to go to a, a, an atom, an ion, that had a more complicated structure. And so what we did was we changed to calcium. And we'd had long discussions about, about whether we should do this and, and how to go about it. Danny was really, really keen that we should move to calcium. And um, that was what we did, and that was a good move, and you'll see, you'll see why in, in what follows. And it really it enabled us to move towards... Uh, looking at quantum coherence and working towards quantum information processing. So I showed you the magnesium energy level diagram just now. This is the calcium one. As you see, it's just marginally more complicated. And uh, in particular, instead of needing one laser, we now need, well, we need two here, we need four here, and in principle, we need some others as well. So in practice, you need about 11 laser frequencies uh, instead of one. And... Uh, uh, in fact, you can get away with six, six distinct lasers, but you, but you need 11 laser frequencies from them. So this, um, this made life a lot more complicated. However, you didn't need dye lasers for all of these. We could now use um, uh, semiconductor diode lasers. And the theory, and this was the case that Danny made, the theory was that diode lasers are so much better behaved than dye lasers that... Um, it meant that it would be easy to have six di diode lasers running at the same time compared to having one dye laser. Um, that was the theory. It wasn't quite so easy in practice. But what, this, what calcium allowed us to do is to study a transition like this one. And this is the one that allows you to do interesting physics because um, it goes from the ground state, which you can populate easily from all these other lasers, and it goes up to a long-lived level here. This level has a lifetime of about a second, so you can look at coherent effects in this transition. And in fact, I'm going to show diagrams later where all I show of this whole energy level structure is just those two levels. And I'm going to label them G and E. So when you come to that in a few slides time, uh, you, you can uh, note that that's what I'm referring to, is just those two levels, and I'm forgetting the rest, because all they are involved in is getting the iron into this state in the first place. Okay? 
So uh, successfully trapping calcium was a challenge. Um, I went through this talk with um, the students yesterday and somebody muttered under their breath and it still is. <laughs> so it still is. Um, and the problem is that you need to have all those lasers running properly at the same time. That's the difficulty. Um, and, but it works. Here is, here is a plot of fluorescence, the same sort of thing as I showed before. This is from calcium. Um, and this is, uh, this is calcium ions in the penning trap. Here's, the, here's some of the, this is one of the diode lasers that we use, and there's, there's just a part of the optics that you can see on the optical table. So the experiment has become quite a lot more complicated because there's so many of these lasers. But this now opened up the possibility that we could do uh, some more experiments towards quantum coherence. Um, we built several other traps on the way, and uh, this, is, this is some of them. Uh, and uh, in fact, this one is the one that, is one that we're still using at the moment. But one trap in particular I want to mention is this one. This was, this was Danny's baby. Um, we call this the pad trap because the electrodes uh, are sort of pads of metal on a piece of circuit board. So it was built, it was a really low technology trap. Uh, this is just an etched circuit board and there are two of them facing each other and connections through the back of the board. And the idea of this trap was to be able to move ions around between different trapping sites. Now, moving ions along a magnetic field is easy because they like to stay along a magnetic field line. But what we wanted to do was to move them transverse to the magnetic field lines. And that's quite difficult because charged particles don't like going across magnetic field lines. But Danny uh, worked out a way of doing this. Uh, I was never sure whether it was going to work or not, but it did. And um, this is the demonstration. So what we've got here is we've got ions in the trap at this point. And then where this arrow appears, we do these things here. So we change the, the electric fields by changing the, um, the potentials applied to all of these electrodes. So we can, we can put different potentials on all of those electrodes. So we change the potentials to give an electric field that makes the ion move sideways. Then we turn the trap back on, and it's now trapped in a different ion trap. And then we reverse the process, bring it back again, and then we look to see if there's signal. And lo and behold, there is still signal here. We lose a few of the ions each time. So you can repeat this process, and you can see you just get an exponential decay of the number of ions, um, having moved it. So they've been moved backwards and forwards about 10 or 20 times, and you're still able to see some signal. So that was a, quite a nice demonstration that we could move ions around in a way that you wouldn't normally expect to be able to do in the trap. The other thing that we, or one of the other things that we started to look at at this time was to look at Coulomb crystals. So these are, these are structures that form when you take away all the energy by using laser cooling. Um, the ions get so cold that they go down to the bottom of the potential well they're sitting in, and then they form a, a, a crystal-like structure because the Coulomb repulsion pushes them apart from each other, and they will fall into like a crystal um, lattice. And... Um, uh, in his inaugural, and you might hear some more about this later, when Danny gave his inaugural in 2013, he really wanted to do a demonstration. So what he did was he set up a live link from the lab, and in the lab they were, they were, they were trapping some ions in a crystal, and then he was able to show in the inaugural how the, uh, the structure of the crystal could be changed. Um, this was the sort of thing that, that we can do here. There's a chain of ions. Uh, 29 ions, and this is, this is with a very low trapping potential, and when you do that, they'll always, they'll always go into a string, and then um, as you change the trapping potential, they'll go into different sorts of configurations, and here are some examples. This is with four ions. There's a string, and then they start to go into a zigzag structure, and eventually they go into, they squish them down into a square. So this is, these are some experiments that we were able to do um, with Coulomb crystals in a penning trap. And these were, these, these, um, this sort of manipulation of small numbers of ions in a penning trap hadn't been done before. So we were very pleased to be able to achieve this. Oops. Um, so I showed you this list earlier, um, and we've, we've ticked off the first few of these, um, these things now. We've trapped ions. We've... Um, uh, we found out how to have a single ion in the trap. Now we need to go on to 
put the ions in the ground state of the motion. And for that, you need a, a much more highly stabilized and well-controlled laser. So uh, we built that. In fact, the person who built that is here today, um, this laser here. And once you've got that laser, you can start to manipulate ions coherently between those two levels that I, uh, I identified earlier on. And uh, so I need to say a little bit about what that manipulation is. I'll try and go through this quickly. So here are the two levels that I, that I said earlier. Between This is the ground state, and this is an excited, a long-lived excited state. But really, this is a simple harmonic oscillator. So you have to think about the energy levels of the simple harmonic oscillator and both, uh, both ends of that transition. And uh, here's the ion sitting in one of those levels. You can drive three sorts of transitions. You can drive a transition, which we call the carrier, where the quantum number of the vibration, uh, sorry, the quantum number of the vibration stays the same. And then the next one, if you go to blue, a blue sideband, uh, it goes up one, it goes up one step of this ladder, or there's a red sideband where it goes down one step of that ladder. Okay, so those are the three sorts of transitions that you can drive in this system. And what we want to do is a process called sideband cooling, and what you do with that is you drive this red sideband over and over and over again, and so wherever it starts over here, it goes down one step on the ladder every time it excites, and eventually it must end up in the ground state, okay? because it, goes, it, it excites up on the red side, and when it decays, it will stay in the same state, generally, and then it will, so each time it excites, it comes down one notch. Then the question is, what happens when it gets to the ground state here? What happens when it gets here? Well, if you think what that red sideband does, it tries to go from the ground state here to a state that's here somewhere, but there isn't a state there. So that sideband, uh, that red sideband, has to disappear at that point because there's nowhere where the ion can go. So the signature that you've achieved the sideband cooling is that that red sideband disappears. And um, here's, a, here's a spectrum um, just of when, before we do, do the sideband cooling, when lots of these levels are occupied, okay? Uh, lots of these levels are occupied. Then you see that a sideband spectrum that's... Um, uh, that has lots of sidebands. Here's the carrier. Oh. Ah. Sorry about this. Here's the carrier in the middle. And then there's, uh, there's a couple of red sidebands and a couple of blue sidebands. So this corresponds to when you've, when you've cooled it as far as you can with the usual laser cooling. Then we, what we then want to do is to do the sideband cooling. And the demonstration, as I said, that the sideband cooling has worked is when the red sideband disappears. Now, when Danny did his inaugural lecture, we'd achieved this about one week before. We'd finally got this sideband cooling to work. We'd been working on it for a long time, but it was in really good timing for his inaugural lecture, and he showed a spectrum like this, and you can see here that um, uh, the red sideband is just noise, and here's the blue sideband. And it turns out that the ratio of the height of this and that corresponds to how much population there is that's not in the ground state. And it, 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 if you measure the size that this could be, and then you compare it with uh, the size of this one, it means that about 98% of the population is in that, that ground state. And that corresponds, it's difficult to say what the temperature of one particle is. If you think of it as a temperature, it's about one microkelvin. And this, remember, is in a room temperature apparatus. Um, so this ion is sitting there at about a microkelvin. What you can then do is you can measure the heating rate. In other words, if you put it in that ground state, how long does it stay there? And what we were able to measure is the heating rate. It goes up about a third of a step every second. And that's actually the lowest heating rate that's been measured in any iron trap, in any system. So we were really pleased with that result, uh, which came out um, around just after Danny did his inaugural lecture. Um, now, in order to demonstrate quantum coherence, you need to do a little bit more than that. You need, to, you, need to put the state, you need to put the iron into a superposition of two states. And so those two states, G and E, that I talked about, you can put the iron so that, if you like, it's in both of those states at the same time. And uh, the, the characteristic signature from that is called Rabi oscillations. So when the iron's in the superposition, you should see Rabi oscillations. And that means that the signal that you see from the ions oscillates as a function of time. And this is a clear demonstration. 
And uh, this, was, this was the day before Danny's inaugural lecture that we managed to get uh, this signal for Rabi oscillations. Um, so the students were working really hard in the lab just before the lecture, and I think this was the night before his lecture. They sent him this plot, so that's why it's so, um, so messy, is because it was literally hot off the press um, the day of his inaugural lecture. But these oscillations demonstrate that you've got a coherent superposition of those two states. Uh, we can do it a bit nicer now, um, and this is uh, more recent results that we've obtained in the lab. And the coherence time is around a millisecond, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is we're really pleased with, and it really is limited probably by the laser rather than by the iron system. So um, here's, that, here's that checklist again of the things we need to do uh, in order to see quantum coherence, and we've now managed to achieve all of those things. And Rabi oscillations is the, is the signature uh, that we've been able to, uh, to start to see quantum coherence. So where do we go next? Um, Danny's uh, aim was to, was to work towards quantum computing with ions in a penning trap. He was interested in demonstrating quantum gates and in applications in quantum simulation and quantum information processing. And um, uh, in the period after... Uh, when he, after his diagnosis, he was at home for about a year, he remained really keenly interested in what we were doing. And when we had group meetings, he would always join us by Skype. And he was contributing all the time to what we were doing. He was really interested to know what was going on. And these are the sorts of things that we were able to do in that last year. So we've now managed to sideband cool two ions rather than just one iron. Um, so here's, here's two ions sitting in the trap there. Um, and we're now able to sideband call both ions at the same time. It's, uh, that isn't twice as difficult as doing one iron. It's like it, get, it goes up as the square of the number of ions. So that was a really difficult experiment, um, but we've now managed to call two ions at the same time. Um, and we've also managed to call the radial motion of the ion. So well, everything I've spoken about up to now is the axial motion of the ion along the magnetic field line. This is the motion perpendicular to that line, which, if you remember, had that sort of spiral structure, so it's more complicated. But again, here, you see the red and blue sidebands. Here's the carrier. Here's the blue sideband. And here's the red sideband disappearing after we've done the sideband cooling. So again, that's a really significant step. And um, that now uh, allows us to move on. And the next stop is uh, quantum gates. So that's what we're uh, moving towards now. So uh, I'm going to finish. Uh, it's really hard to, to, to come up with an appropriate summary. Danny was a really, he was a fantastic colleague, and he was a great scientist, and he was always just fun to work with. Uh, he really enjoyed doing his science. He was passionate about it. He was completely committed to his students, uh, his postgraduate students in the lab, and also his senior tutor to the undergraduates. And uh, so... He was working here for over 20 years uh, in this area of science, and now we've got to the point, and uh, he, he was still with us, we got to the point where we could see that getting to um, uh, studying things like quantum gates and quantum information processing in a penning trap is now within reach. So that's, uh, that's where we're now moving to now. So thank you very much for listening.